not nearly as exciting as you think it is. That's not, that's not entirely true. It is an exciting book, but it's not exciting in the way that most people make it out to be. Uh, it is a book that contains information about the end of the world, but it is not a book telling you how to tell when the end of the world is coming, nor is it a book exclusively about the end of the world. In fact, the end of the world is only one part of the book. What the book is really about is what the first verse tells you it is about. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ, the revealing of Jesus Christ, the appearing of Jesus Christ. It is a book telling you about who Jesus is and what he's done and what that means for you. And then also what he's coming again to do, how this is going to affect all well, the life of mankind into eternity. There is so much information in this book, uh, we will not be able to cover every single thing that could be covered in the three months we're going to spend on it. Uh, with today being a little bit of an exception, we're going to be moving at almost hyperdrive speed. Uh, two to even three chapters a week, which is going to be just a ton of information. So what we're going to try to do as we do this, though, is give you the main pieces for navigating the book so that you are not well, led astray by those who would teach you that it's a, a road map for the end of the world, a means of discerning where the Antichrist is going to show up in the European Union or maybe out of Russia or Turkey or somewhere like that, um, but that it is a book about Jesus, who he is, what he's done, what that means for you as a Christian waiting in this veil of tears even I would say this little season of Satan, when he still has time, but he knows his time is short, so he causes the church to suffer. Well, as the church suffers in the dispersion of uh, Christianity throughout the world, under the devil's tyranny of death and sin, who do you look to? What do you wait for? Where is your hope? And then again, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. You look to him, the one whom they have pierced, as we're going to hear it said today in chapter Cool. All right. Another really important thing about the book before you even go into it is very, very popular in some evangelical circles today to talk about only reading the Bible literally. And when they use that word, they have a very narrow definition of, of the word literally. Uh, they don't mean reading the book as the text wants you to read it. They mean reading the book as if it is a dictionary or a set of proverbs. That is, that every single verse can be pulled out by itself and mean something by itself, its full truth, without its context. As opposed to reading the book, say, according to its genre. Do you read a letter from your grandmother the same way that you read the newspaper? No, you don't. If the newspaper says a man, uh, well, if the newspaper says, we have one billion dollars in debt, and there's a little more of that sentence, as the American you know, people, we have $1 million billion dollars of debt. You're going to read that differently than if your grandma writes and says we have $1 billion dollars of debt, right? Mm. But the context, the genre is going to tell you a little bit about how to understand it. Now, this is very important if you actually want to read the Bible literally, yeah? Because the Bible has different genres within it. Uh, you have Old Testament histories, these, these pan meta histories of the Jewish people. You got the book of Leviticus, which is partially history, partially of an actual manual for worship in the Old Testament. Uh, you have the books of the prophets, which are just flush with confusing symbolism and analogy, uh, as well as what you might call typology. Uh, you have the New Testament Gospels, which even within them have different uh, emphases in genre. Luke is the most historical. John goes off and gets all symbolic all the time. Yeah? So you've got to let the author tell you a little bit about what they want you to understand. This is doubly so for the book of Revelation, because there is just so much imagery, so many pictures, so many ideas. If you go to it like it's a newspaper, you're bound to have a little bit of trouble. If you don't let John even tell you how he wants you to understand the book, which he does in chapter 1, you're going to go and find things that are simply not there. You're going to be forced to make stuff up. Because you see this picture of this giant beast with horns and speaking loud boasts. Well, what is that? I don't know. Maybe it, it, it's, it's an actual beast. It's going to come out of the sea. It's going to like rampage like Godzilla across the land. And then there's these, these uh, uh, demonic-looking locust things with armor that can't be pierced. Well, but those aren't, it's, it's so funny. You know, they don't read those as locusts, though. Those are helicopters. Wait a minute. The thing you find then about the evangelicals, they're not really consistent with this. 
Especially when you get to other texts in the Bible, this is my body. Baptism saves. Oh, no, those are symbolic. Those are symbolic. Oh, okay, sure. Anyway. Revelation is full of symbolism, and John's going to tell us that in chapter 1 if we pay attention to it. But you've got to kind of have that in your head going in, that it, it doesn't read like every other book in the Bible. It reads a lot like Daniel. It reads a lot like Zechariah. That is, it is apocalyptic, which is a genre of uh, Old to Middle Testamental um, apocalyptic intertestamental Semi-prophecy, uh, it is prophecy, but not the way that, say, Isaiah wrote prophecy, is, is like a code of images. And if you don't know the code, you won't be able to understand what the images mean. It usually arises, especially in the Old Testament, uh, when the Jewish people are under persecution and or oppression by a foreign power who might not want them talking about what they believe in really clear terms. And so they use these images to kind of hide it a little bit beneath their history. A lot of the images, the symbols, come out of their previous history. So they'll talk about um, Egypt, but they mean Babylon, because they're in Babylon. Well, guess what? John's going to now talk about Babylon, but he means just the world, the devil, right? Uh, the, the reign of the devil. This, this symbolism drawn from the past as history, as code for apocalypse, for revealing a deeper truth that they can't really... Uh, get out. Think about it this way. Where is John when he writes this book? Anybody know that without reading it? He's on the island of Patmos because he is he's in exile. That would be prison. So you think they're going to let him send out a missive about how the next Caesar is going to persecute people and so everyone needs to be ready for that. No, they're not going to let him get that out. But he can send out something about a big beast with Caesar's name written on it in Hebrew numbers. Because they're not going to know. Right? You know, this is trite. What is this stuff? Yeah? That's the purpose of apocalyptic genre of literature. So that's just really key to know going into the book. How much time have I wasted? Yes. And 19. Oh, no, good. Four minutes in. <laughs> um, all right. Codes of energy. Oh, and so the code, uh -huh. this was a nice gift, but these things always make that squeaky noise. Um, the code for Revelation is the Old Testament. And this is where there's going to be so much information in the book, I can't possibly, get, we, we would just sit here in every verse, I'd say, now go look up this verse, this verse, and this verse, and see how it references these verses. Then you'd really want to read the context of those verses, and then take all the information and pour it back into the one verse we're looking at in its context. Well, the book's 21 chapters long, and we, we can't do this. Yeah, this is too much. But put it in your head, no going in, that the symbolism of Revelation is exclusively drawn from the Old Testament narratives. And so uh, there are these constant references. It's like two-thirds of the book has an Old Testament parallel passage. Uh, you're going to see this almost right off the bat um, in, in more than one way. All right. I think that's all we need to do for prelude. Uh, oh, one more. We'll do a little bit about John. So there's, there's debate about the dating of this book. When was it written? But I don't think there's much debate about it being one of the last books of the New Testament written because John was the last living apostle and likely wrote all of his books very late. Now, does that, does very late mean 70, 75? That would be very early dating in the argument about this. Does very late mean 100, 105? That would be a very late dating. Uh, I'm a fan of uh, the, the 90s, the mid-90s dating, uh, which John would have died about 10 years after that. Uh, put that in context, Early days for the Gospels are anywhere from the late 30s, mid 40s to the 60s. Yeah? So think 30 years to maybe 40 years after the other Gospels have been written. Paul's letters are even early, those are definitely in the 30s and 40s. Um, so it's, if it's a whole generation removed. You have a, a generation that has been in church and had kids, and those kids are now in their 30s, that John is overseeing. He was the elder, the bishop. Of all the churches in Turkey, Asia Minor, seated at Ephesus, being kind of the center of this. This is fascinating because guess what the churches he's going to write to are? Those seven letters that are going to show up right at the start of this book. The churches in Asia Minor. Not every church, but seven of them. Why? Because he's their overseer now in exile. He's writing them to warn them about the persecution which they are going to be enduring. 
One of the other questions comes up, though, with this dating is, the ones who want an early dating, they want to have it be before 70 AD because something else happened in 70 AD. And we know what that was? Jerusalem Temple got destroyed. Their argument for why it needs to be there, I cannot remember. I've dismissed it, apparently. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, my argument, or not my argument, the, I think one of the main arguments for why it's later is that he, met, he never mentions the temple. Um, is that right? I think it's right. There's no mention of the temple. He measures Jerusalem without mentioning the temple. When in the Old Testament, the temple is measured, if I'm not mistaken. So I, I, I'm thinking this is post, uh, post temple destruction by 20 years. Outside of Jerusalem, which means that the entire church has been dispersed from Jerusalem as well. One of the things that goes with temple destruction is the Christians living in Jerusalem are mainly spread out. They're no longer in Jerusalem. There's a few, but not, most of them are not there anymore. So everybody's spread out across uh, the Mediterranean, uh, and all the other apostles then are, are dead. Right? So scripture, in one sense, has been established at this point. Nobody else can write scripture. What is scripture? Scripture is the writings we have from the hands of the apostles. That's why we trust it. These are the guys who just breathed on and said, receive the Holy Spirit in a special way. Yeah? And then he goes and tells them things like, the Holy Spirit's going to call them on to everything I ever told you. Right? That promise, sadly, is not for you. Yeah? That was for them, so they could write this down so that we can actually remember it. Because we can remember it in a different way, by going to the Word. Um, so, last of the Apostle, question, does he write Revelation first or John first? Uh, I think Revelation comes first because... Early on, we're going to see a commission of John where uh, in, the, in the appearance that God makes to him at the start, God says, John, it's time for you to write. Write this down. Now, you haven't written yet. Guess what? I am going to not come back before you're dead, which was kind of an open question for a little while there, at least for him, um, which he says at the end of John's Gospel. Why do I think this goes before John's Gospel? I think this is the rough draft for John's Gospel. He wrote this one. He got all into the symbolism. He got real excited. Apocalyptic literature. Yay, yay, yay. And he went, mm, yeah, that's pretty good. I can do better. And then John's Gospel becomes his sort of name opus. Now, most of that is speculation, but it's also, it gives you a context. Uh, where is he? He's a generation removed. Uh, who is he writing to? Asia Minor, really. Um, other churches end up getting copies of this book. It's going to Asia Minor, uh, to people he has overseen. He is the last apostle. These are his, in one sense, uh, these are the, in one sense, last words from Christ before he stops speaking, yeah, at least in, in giving new information. Um, there's a debate about that in the Christian world today, too, I suppose. But anyway, let's, let's dig into the text. Uh, we today are just going to read chapter 1, verses 1 through 20, the whole, the whole chapter. Uh, this is really the, the prologue. Another thing about John's books, both of his books have prologues and epilogues. A beginning section and an ending section that kind of are like bookends to it, with the main text being in the center. It's not that the prologue and epilogue don't say anything, they say a lot. They actually tell you how to read what's on the inside and what he was really trying to get at. But they, they also don't fit the structure of what's on the inside. Now, in John's Gospel, you know this in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, the Word was God, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have become his glory, full of grace and truth. And then finally he starts telling the story. John was baptizing. Um, epilogue is the, the they find Jesus barbecuing by the seashore he forgives Peter three times, that kind of stuff it's all post, post resurrection uh, same stuff's going on here, chapter one is the epilogue and the commissioning of John uh, where he is going to uh, claim what he's doing and then claim the right to do it because of this vision he has where Jesus actually shows up, alright, I'm going to read all the way through the chapter <clears throat> The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. That's why I don't want you to read it. I think. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> that's great. Um, <laughs> Uh, oh wait, blessed are those who hear. See, you get blessed. Um, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it for the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, ruler of the kings on earth. 
To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God who is, and who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation, and the kingdom, and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, saying, Write what you see in a book. And send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, and to Smyrna, and to Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe, and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, and the living one. I died. Behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are, and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. <clears throat> All right, so much cool stuff in there. Um, we're going to start, though, with verse 20. Because verse 20 is your code key, to some extent at least. At the very least, is the hint, hey, there's code here. Yeah. As for the mystery, hey, as for all this stuff that doesn't make any sense, because it's like it's lampstands and, and uh, stars, and he's got stars in his hand. How do you do that? I don't know. Uh, what, what did that look like? What were they, uh, was it brighter than the sun that was his face? Oh, it's crazy. Anyway, these things don't look normal, right? I mean, this isn't what you see every day. It's a mystery. What's going on? Granted, he's, he said, I'm God. I got some crazy stuff going on in the first place. But these things mean something. And I'm going to tell you what these first two mean. Break it down for you. The seven stars are the, I'm getting backwards, are the angels. Is that right? Yes. Uh, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, to whom I just told you to write. And the seven lampstands are the actual seven churches, to whom I just told you to write. That is to say, if you're going to read the book literally, you're going to get a little confused, because the lampstands are literally, symbolically, churches. They're something entirely different. They symbolize Now, he breaks this one down and gives it to you. To know that the rest of it is a reference to the Old Testament is, is not as obvious, it's not as clear. But really, we do need to hang our hat on this verse in terms of those who insist that this book cannot be read symbolically. Well, then they're not listening to Jesus, because the first thing he says is, this is a symbolic revelation. The things that I'm showing you mean something else. We have to let that then begin our, our interpretation of everything that is to come. Um, all right. Now, even as that he makes it clear that the seven lampstands are seven churches, he makes it confusing because he says that each of these churches has an angel. Where do we keep our angel? I'm curious. I want to see it. You guys haven't shown me yet. Oh, then you're here. Where, where's our angel? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Is, this has led to no small amount of debate in the history of interpretation of Revelation. Uh, there are two main answers. Uh, I'm going to give you the one I disagree with first. Uh, and it's not that it, it can't be right, though. Right? This is one of those places where you can kind of pick which one you like more. 
Uh, one is that, uh, as we know that all people, uh, all Christians, that is, are cared for by the angels, that we even have guardian angels assigned to us, lest we strike our feet against a stone, as the, as the psalm says, although my angel hasn't been doing his job, because I've done my toe too long. Um, the, uh, uh, again, not the point, right? The point is to protect you from hell. Uh, as uh, Christians are cared for by the angels, so also each church, in a sense, would then be, each assembly would be given an angel, a uh, spiritual angel, to watch over, care for, and protect it from, from harm and danger. Nothing really wrong with that interpretation. Um, quite possibly true, even if it's not the right interpretation of the text. Um, the other option is that John is using the word angel a little more loosely here, where angel is a Greek word um, spelled with two G's. And the N is not there as the sound becomes in with Greek two G's. Uh, angelos, uh, which does not mean spiritual being in general Greek. It's a word that is used by uh, the Old Testament in Greek to talk about spiritual beings that God sent to the prophets as angelos, as messengers. Now, the word just means messenger. Now because of its use in the Septuagint, the Old Testament in Greek, to describe these spiritual beings as messengers, it does come to mean spiritual being as well, but it doesn't only mean that. It can also just mean messenger. Mm. Uh, so, in that way, John could also be saying that these seven stars represent the seven messengers of these churches, which also does fit nicely into, at least in the way his gospel talks about, pastors, the ones who are sent to deliver the message. So the letter is to the seven pastors and the seven churches together, which is what church is, pastor and people together around the word of God coming to them. We just went through all that with ecclesiology in the fall of that. That is the way I tend to think of, of this. Um, perhaps it's selfish. I have fun comfort knowing that Jesus has actually got me as pastor in his hand. And it's not up to me to be perfect to make it work. This is his sending, his doing. Now I can find that in other passages of Scripture, too. Um, I just find a lesser reasoning for the angel one in the rest of the book. Uh, because if Revelation is about anything other than Jesus, which it's not, um, it is about Jesus' church, which again is his assembly, which is his people, but not just his people getting together for a potluck, although that's good, too. But his people around his word, and that word must be messaged. And John himself is doing that, right? That's exactly what he's doing. He's the foremost of us at this moment. And he's sending this copy of this letter to these seven churches. Well, who's going to read that letter and start preaching it? It's right there. It's, just, it's kind of obvious in a sense what this is about. Now, if you want to take the angel's path, and there are different pastors who do, that's, that's fine too. Anyway, so, either way, you got two answers that do kind of make sense of the mystery. Yeah. As for the mystery of these seven stars, seven lampstands, they are the seven churches gathered around word and sacraments that I, Jesus, am taking care of. And here's what I want you to write to them. That's what we're going to look at next week. These seven specific letters to each one of these churches. All right, now going backwards from there into the rest of, of uh, chapter one, let's pick apart uh, the rest of chapter one. Verses 1 through 3 is really uh, much of what I said at the start, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Here it is. Here's the word. Here's what is to be believed about who Jesus is and what he's done. John is bearing witness to this word of God to you, this testimony, uh, this, this truth set down, affirmed by more than one person, therefore it's verifiable. It's fact. At least according to scripture, it's fact. According to the way that Christianity has thought and uh, Judaism thought, two people say it's true, then it's fact, unless you can prove them wrong. Yeah. Um, as opposed to kind of testing in a laboratory. Um, so here is the fact about Jesus. Here is the true word of God, which John is preaching as the last apostle. So blessed are you if this word comes to you. Yeah? Having received a good word. The word blessed comes from two words, good and word. Yeah? Having received a good word, are you, if you hear this? And with hearing it, you also have to believe it. And now it says keep 
there. Those who keep what is written is so easy, especially in English, but it's just a human problem. We have this thing called the Acinio Legus. You guys know Brian Wolf and Ruby Thomas. Acinio Legus, Latin, opinion of the law. We have this opinion of the law built into our hearts that whenever we hear something as humans, we want to make it about who we are and what we have to do. It's just the natural way that we, we absorb information. It's part of our sin. Yeah? Uh, life's about me and what I do, not about what's outside of me. So it's easy to hear that word keep and think it means opinion legis, those who do the things that are written in this book. Yeah? As opposed to keeping it by believing. Yeah? To guard, to cherish this word as an absolute truth. Which, I mean, how do you do any of what happens in chapter 1? You can't do anything. There's no commands there. All it is is, hey, Jesus is God. He was crucified. Now he's raised. Keep that. Guard that. Cherish that. That's the gospel. That's the truth. Yeah? It is the eternal promise of God that mankind is risen from the dead in the person of Jesus. Blessed are those who hear this and believe it. Yeah? It's the opening. There's three verses. Pretty cool stuff. The gospel right off the bat. Verse 4, John had seven churches. Classic way of beginning a letter, put your name first. And then the grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. A couple interesting things about that, I'm not going to get too deep in it, but a reference to possibly uh, the burning bush with Moses. Um, I am the one who I am. Um, uh, in the, when it is translated into the Septuagint in Greek, in Old Testament in Greek, uh, it has similar language to I am the one who is. John then adds this, who was and who is to come, which is pointing us toward uh, Jesus, what he's done, what he's going to do. Uh, another fascinating piece of this is that he leaves in the Greek uh, the word, uh, the one who is, I think, I think I'm going to get this right. Uh, don't quote me on this though, video. Um, <laughs> he leaves the one who is in the nominative form and puts the others in the genitive form, which leaves that first one, the one who is, is sort of a higher edge to it, which is like, why would he do that? Well, what's he going to do next? He's going to talk about the Trinity. So it's almost as if it's, there's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit thing. I'm going to be Father, Spirit, and Son in the direction he's going. So the one who is, is the Father, the one who was the Spirit, the one who's coming is Jesus. Not that they are all one substance, all these things, right? We don't want to read it that way. That would be to get a little overly literal. Um, but that he is giving this hat tip to the Father's um, oversight of the Trinity in its economy. <laughs> That's very technical language, uh, so that I don't get charged with heresy. Um, the Father is first among equals. They are all equal in substance, but as they work together, the Son does submit to the Father. That's like what we've done, he says. Paul says in another place, he will hand over all things back to the Father. Yeah? Uh, so the Father has this first among equals reality, not in substance. They are all homozeus, they are all one God. But that as they work with each other, as they have an economy, the Father comes first. And there's a kind of a hat tip to this in the Greek language with this who is thing. But the who is is a little bit higher. Now the next verse he's going to go in and actually talk about this one who is and who was and who is to come. Um, oh, excuse me. I got a little off there. So this who is and who is, was and is to come is this hat tip to the Father. Yes, that's what I mean. Now, he's going to continue breaking down the Trinity putting the Spirit before the Son, which is unique, but there's a reason for that, which I'll hopefully show you in a second. From the seven spirits who are before his throne. Now before we get to that, why are there seven spirits? Or, you can also translate this as seven-fold spirit singular. Um, why are there seven spirits? It's kind of weird. I thought there was only one Holy Spirit. Maybe there's more. Hey, maybe there's something to the Jehovah's Witnesses and the whole spirit being a power. Yeah? Or maybe not. Um, in Zechariah 3, I believe, I'm not going to go look it up. Um, you can look it up later, right? Zechariah 3. Uh, there is a revelation of a spirit with seven eyes uh, who is very clearly defined as the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, the number seven throughout the Old Testament also is the number of holiness or set-apartness of God. So even just as a symbolic number, the sevenfold spirit is the word Holy Spirit. Right? Um, uh, how can I prove this? Uh, there's a couple ways to go about it. Number three is the number of God. Number four is the number of creation. 
right? I just assert the two new things. Um, why is three the number of God, Trinity? This is all a Hebraic thought, by the way. Four is the number of the earth, or creation, four corners of the earth, four winds, those kind of things. You have these together, and you have God's created earth, which once was only in the seventh part. You have also the seven of the Sabbath. Seven days God created, and on the seventh he rested. And basically, from those two things, the latter Old Testament prophets pick up on this seventh thing and just start using it left and right, especially in Zechariah, to describe holiness and wisdom. Well, they're just holiness. All of this being a really long roundabout way of saying that when John says, Greetings, grace to you from the seven spirits who are before the throne of God, this is not some other thing. This is the Holy Spirit, the second person of the Trinity. And notice how the seven, these seven spirits, or sevenfold spirit, is put on the same part with the one who is and who was and who is to come. Grace and peace to you from the one who is, and from the seven spirits, and from Jesus Christ. Now, if you just are completely anti-Trinitarian, you can certainly find a way around this, right? Um, this isn't the place that you prove the Trinity, but it's kind of like staring in the face. Here's the Trinity. Uh, the Holy Spirit and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. Now, what's cool about this is, <laughs> according to Lewis Bright, who's a commentary I didn't bring, I'll have some next week to try to study. Um, he, uh, uh, this is the only place in the New Testament where this happens. It's not. They're not in the only place in the Bible where this happens, where you have the Trinity clearly set forward right at the start of the book. It's not. There's one other place, which is often talked about when you read it, but no one ever really remembers it. How's the book of Genesis start? In the beginning, no, that's, that's John. In the beginning was God. God created the heavens and the earth. And it goes on and talks about what's hovering over the waters? Spirit. The Spirit of God. Does it mention the Word of God yet? No. It just, it just mentions the Spirit of God. And then God said, after the Spirit, let there be light. But what's the order there? Father, Spirit, Word. Hey, look what John just did. As he opens his last book, as a set in a sense. Yeah? Father, Spirit, Word. Um, all of Revelation does this, right? He's just playing on these themes. He's riffing, right? He has no grateful dead. Yeah? These guys were playing it. I don't I didn't know really got into it that much. But they, I do know they play a song for 45 minutes. Right? And the same riff. Uh, it just keep going. But they were jammed over and over. Well, John's jamming on the Old Testament. That's what he's doing. He's not quoting it, right? He's not proof texting. He's playing on the themes. Yeah? Uh, and it's right there with this Trinitarian opening, which kind of is a hat to begin to Genesis, saying, hey, look, where's the Trinity in the Genesis too? Yeah. If you want to prove the Trinity, by the way, Matthew 28, the only way they get around it is they say, and people say this, uh, that's not really in the Bible. That, that was Adam later. Okay, fine. Well, I can't argue with that. <laughs> you know, let's, let's start throwing out Bible verses. Um, that's, that's the place where the Trinity really exists clearly. This is a hat tip and a push for it. Look, here is grace and peace to you, which I just preached to you in Jesus' name. It's from this Trinitarian God, the Father who was, the Holy Spirit who is, uh, and Jesus Christ, the faithful witness who is coming. He's the firstborn from the dead. More gospel there we can get into, but we're, we're out of time, so we're going to move forward. But firstborn from the dead, goodness gracious. Firstborn of who? Mankind. Okay? There was no Adam. All who are born from him die. He is the new Adam. All who are born from him live. He is the firstborn, right? the first man, the first new man. And then John, you know, picking up on this very idea, it's just it's such good news, he breaks into a doxology. He can't help himself. He praises God. He praises Jesus. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Yeah? That's what this is about. That atonement which Jesus purchased on the cross. Who has made us a kingdom. Priest to his God and Father. Uh, two different ideas there. A kingdom, uh, a reign, a place where God rules. Priests, uh, those who are able to walk into the presence of God. That's really what priest is. Those who go and mediate to God. But we're all priests. We're all in the presence of God. Right? Does just the pastor take the Lord's Supper? No. In the Old Testament, just the priest went into the temple and offered the sacrifices there. But now it's coming out to you. Because you're priests too. Um, not, yeah, not in the you're all pastors sense, don't do that. Uh, but in the all, you're all holy. You're all connected to God directly through the body and blood of Christ. Um, because this is so stinking awesome, 
To him be glory forever and ever in dominion. Yeah. Right? <laughs> oh, that's what all men are going to say. Yeah. Um, he's, he's praising him for this in dominion. Gotta love that word. To him be despotism forever. Yeah. May he forever be our tyrant king. Because he's a good tyrant. But we have this problem, especially as Americans. We hate authority so much. We hate the idea of kings. Uh, we want to be free. And by that, we mean free from everything. Uh, Christianity is about freedom from sin, death, and the devil. But to be free from sin, death, and the devil, you need a king to protect you. And that's, that's what Jesus is. So his dominion, his despotism, even, is a good thing. Um, and check it out. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye shall see him. This is again a Zechariah reference in this chapter 12. Even those who pierced him, which is cool to see the word pierced in the Old Testament, because it's like that prophecy thing. Like, oh, hey, they foresaw this. Um, those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail. On account of him. It is all people, when he comes again, will be terrified by this. His coming is not happy for everyone. Uh, it is to judge and destroy, uh, to crush. Uh, and yet, Jones says, even so, amen. Uh, even though this is a terrifying thing in the center of the world, so be it. Why? Because we have a good king. We have a good king who's actually bought us by his blood. We believe that. We'll go through the fire in him. Same way that the army went through the flood. So even so on that. He, he then speaks. Argument of verse 8. Who's, who's speaking? Is it Jesus? Is it the Father? Most scholars think the Father. This is the only place I'm going to agree with him probably. Uh, later they think it's the Father again. I think it's Jesus later. Um, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God. That means beginning and the end. Um, alpha is the Greek letter uh, A. And Omega is the Greek letter B. O, but it's actually in the place of Z is the last letter in the alphabet, right? So I am the beginning and the end of the alphabet, the beginning and the end of word, thought, fact, truth, all things. Yeah. I am the start and the finish, says the Lord God, again, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. That word Almighty is a great word. Easy to just go straight over it, but you know, it's the word all and the word mighty. There is nothing more mighty than the Almighty. I mean, you can't fathom what it means to be Almighty. You wish you were. I wish I was. Especially when I stub my toe. <laughs> um, I, I stop the toe from hurting. Right? Uh, God is, Jesus is, Almighty, power over all things. Uh, this is where, when we start asking questions about, say, I don't know, six day creation, um, baptism, saving, things like that, uh, how are these things possible? Because God's Almighty. That's how, you know, he, he has power over everything. And so when he says something is going to be, that's the way that it is. It's not our job as Christians to argue with him. Our job as Christians is to hear what he says, and then, insofar as we have this built into us, fight against it and say, how can I find that what he's saying is actually good news? Because most of the time it is, if you believe it. If you don't believe it, it's just bad news. Crazy bad. Hmm. All right. That was time. Lord. I would like to say any questions that I got to push forward. Sorry. Um, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation. There we go. So, who is John really writing to? He is writing to these seven churches, but this idea of the emphasis, tribulation, is pretty darn important. He is going to write to these churches who are, are going to, in their history, undergo uh, persecution. The likes of which we have not seen yet in America. Uh, I hope we never do, but you never know. Um, but the tribulation is more even than just what they're going through. He is talking about the fall. Those who live in the valley of the shadow of death. Yeah? And even as I think he means when he says later, under the little season of Satan. Time in which Satan is allowed to rule. How is this best described as the tribulation? Um, excuse my language, it's the time when it sucks to be alive. And it does. Uh, well, what did I just see this week? Somebody, uh, what was it? I mean, two weeks ago, right, kids were getting killed in schools. This happens all the time, we just don't get in the media all the time. Um, there was this one just this last week that really blew me away. Oh, man, how that happened. Um, no, we have, hmm? Did they? I didn't hear that one. See? I start, I don't even like it. I'm swayed by it anymore. I'm so callous. Um, 
the, uh, we have a member who has uh, uh, brain cancer. Uh, and I, I'm not going to go, go public who it is, but it is public. We pray for him. Young man, 40s, 50s, I don't know his exact age, brain cancer. Okay? It is a terrible time in your life. You never know what's going to take you away. Um, you never know what's going to make something. That's the one I saw. So there's a there's an LCMS pastor named Dan Chambers, young guy, a little older than me, um, who has some health issues in the last three or four years and has lost the ability to walk. After a year of this, his congregation removed him from his call. He couldn't do his job, so that makes sense. But guess what went with his call? His health insurance. And so now, his attempt to rehabilitate is being stopped by that. Uh, he doesn't have enough money to do it. He did get some gifts given to him, so he was able to spend about a month and a half in uh, at a rehab. He was working really hard, but didn't make the progress he wanted to. Got the news, his new health insurance is going to stop covering him. And I saw the thing that got me was this post on Facebook where he said, I have tried so hard, I failed my family. I was only like, and my heart just dropped. Because he's taking it like it's his fault. When it's not, this is, this is the tribulation. This is the curse. We're going to see this quickly in the book. And it's going to be next week and the week after when we see the four horsemen of the apocalypse come out. These aren't the four guys that come out that cause trouble at the end of the world. They, they're here right now. They've been here. War, famine, disease, and tyranny. These things are causing horrible time to live. The tribulation. This is going to come back, this idea. Uh, but I will point it out. This happened right here at the start. I am writing to you because I, John, am a partner in this tribulation. Yeah? I am feeling it too. The tribulation, and I'm a partner in the kingdom. What's the kingdom? Is the word we have received by faith is the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Now notice the distinction between sight, what you see, even what you feel, and the kingdom, which is by faith alone at this point. That doesn't mean by a power you gear up inside yourself to do stuff with. That means by receiving his word and believing it, trusting it to be true. Jesus is actually reigning. In spite of what we see happen, in spite of the little season of the death and the fall and the tribulation, we are also partners in this kingdom where Jesus has defeated it all. And by the power of that word preached, he is saving those who believe it. There is a distinction between these two things, but they're overlapping. They're both existing. We're partners in both of them. Don't hear me saying that all feelings are wrong or not. Right? But if you put your trust in what you feel, you're going to be disappointed eventually. But your trust what God says. Um, partner in the kingdom, and with these two things together, this makes sense now, if you're in this kingdom by faith alone, what you're feeling is the horribleness of the world, it's a good thing we're partners in patient endurance, in waiting for Jesus to come back. I, John, who, who know these things, who are experiencing these things too, uh, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus, that is, because he was a Christian, he was exiled, Tend to be a little confusing. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. What does that mean? He was out there to count. Right? Um, that would be to read into the text something that you would have to find somewhere else in Scripture to prove it. I'll give you something the Scripture says all the time um, to read into the text. When he says I was in the spirit, it means he was reading the Old Testament. He's reading the Bible. There is the spirit of God and the word of God. He's reading the Bible. I was reading the Old Testament on the Lord's day. I was at a church by myself, sadly. I am a preacher, but I couldn't get to the assembly, so I'm reading the scriptures on the Lord's Day, and something nuts does happen. He actually does get a spiritual revelation, um, but that's not where he was first, right? First he was reading the scripture. And he heard behind him a loud voice like a trumpet, saying, write what you see in a book, send it to the seven churches. He turns and he sees this man. All these images now that are going to be described in Jesus are Old Testament references. There's a bunch of them. They're all from different places. But they're all ascribing to Jesus Godness. It's kind of the most important thing. Each one of these things is ascribing to him being God. Um, he sees, uh, he turns to see the voice. He sees the lampstands and one like a son of man. He's got a long robe on with a golden sash. This is a king. The sash would have been around his chest. Uh, kings did that. Uh, the hairs of his head are white like wool. It means uh, that he's old, and old is actually a good thing in the Bible, contrary to what Americans believe. It is a sign of great wisdom and power. Um, and granted, I mean, still, it is those with hoary heads that tend to have the great wisdom and power. I mean, I know the kids are cool and all, but uh, <laughs> wisdom and power? No. Uh, <laughs> um, so the, the white bully has this ancient of days, right? He's old, he's ancient. 
Um, his eyes were a flame of fire. Think of our God as a burning fire, a consuming fire. Think of the burning bush. Think of Mount Sinai, right? Well, that's inside of him. He's a man with all that inside. Amazing. Um, uh, his feet are burnished bronze. Uh, this is a throwback to, uh, uh, I can't think of the exact word. Uh, multiple images. Uh, Isaiah chapter 6 or 5, where Isaiah sees God high and lifted up as one of them. But the image of the burnished bronze is like a warrior's armor, right? So his feet are capable of trampling over anything. Nothing can uh, not be crushed by his feet. Right? So this is an all-powerful thing. Um, like burnished bronze were fine in the furnace. His voice was like the roar of many waters. And I'm forgetting where that reference is right now. Um, I can't think of it. There is a reference to an Old Testament prophet. Uh, in his right hand, he held the seven stars, and from his mouth comes the sharp two-edged sword, which no artist can ever really render that very well, right? because tongues and swords don't tend to... You know, was it, was it like floppy? Floppy sword? Um, I saw, I actually see one artist do a good job of it once. Uh, Jesus is on this white horse. You can't see his face because it's shiny. He's got long flowing hair like Bobby. But the sword, <laughs> that is his, uh, the sword is actually coming through his head. So the hilt of the sword's in the back, and the sword's entirely made of light, and it's shooting through his head, just bursting out in front of him as if it's laying aside all things before him. And so it's both his word and his, his weapon at the same time. It's really the point. The sharp two-edged sword is the word of God, which, as I uh, think Paul says in other places, the Holy Scriptures themselves, you know, this word that is spoken through. Why has it got two edges? Well, as Lutherans really say, well, on the gospel, uh, one side cuts, the other side heals. One side kills, the other side raise, uh, raises. Um, it works both ways, uh, so to speak. Uh, and his face was shining like the sun in full strength. You can't even look at it. You think about it. And that should call to reference uh, a couple of things. Uh, a, in the Old Testament, you could never look at God. You can't. Look at God to die. The guys who got to actually wrestle with God are like, wow, I live. That's impossible. How'd that happen? Uh, and then there's this other thing. This mountain of transfiguration where Jesus shines like the sun. Full fan thing going on here. Okay, he's shining like the sun in full strength. And as a result of this amazing revelation of God in the flesh as he really is, not veiled as he was when he walked among us, John basically dies. Uh, he doesn't quite, but he, he faints. Right? You've seen the, uh, the movies where something crazy happens and the, uh, sorry ladies, the woman like, oh. <laughs> so what he does, he falls down as one dead. He's terrified. Which, almost out of time here, but son of man. There are two main themes for Jesus in this book. One is son of man, the other is uh, Lamb of God. Yeah. We're not going to have much time to dig into Son of Man. It is an intertestamental idea, which actually was very developed in Judaism, although not in the Old Testament. It's, the, it's that 500 years in between time. When Jesus shows up and starts calling himself the Son of Man, uh, he's taking something that people already have ideas about, and it is really to talk about the Christ. It's to talk about the one who rules over the resurrection, uh, it is to talk about the, the king. But in, John, in uh, the book of Revelation, this phrase is a terrifying phrase. This is not the good news phrase. Whereas Lamb of God is the good news phrase. Jesus is portrayed as these two different individuals, both the same, but the Son of Man is there to destroy. And the Lamb of God is there to raise, to heal, to save. Right? Now it's the same person, he does both these things, but these are just titles that have this feel about them. And you see this right here. This, here he is, in all his glory, just shining forth, fire in his eyes, uh, flames in his head. It makes him fall down dead. You notice then what he says. This is also the good news of Jesus. Fear not. That's the gospel. You have no reason to be afraid. It's not a command, be not afraid or else, right? If you're afraid, you're not really a Christian. Right? Not that. that you'll, you'll die trying to keep that up. Uh, it is the proclamation. You have nothing to be afraid of from me, Jesus. Think of Aslan in the, uh, the Narnia series. Uh, um, is he a good lion? No, no, is he a safe lion? No, he's not safe, but he's good. Yeah. Uh, he's good to you. Fear not, I am the first and the last. Now he's saying, I am with God. I am one with God. I am the living one. Why? Gospel. I died, and look, I'm not dead anymore. I live forever. I hold the keys to death. You want to get out of death? I got it. It's covered. Yeah? Uh, I hold the keys to death. Hades is a reference to death. That's going to come back. Um, so write what you've seen. 
Those things that are, see, I'm thinking that's John's gospel. Those things that are going to take place after this, I'm thinking that's the book of Revelation. As for the mystery, I know we've done that. Right? As for the mystery, by the way, uh, what you're going to see needs to be interpreted through the lens of the Old Testament. Much of it is symbolic. Quite the start, huh? We've got three minutes for questions. You said in one of your videos that you didn't agree with one section of Brighton's Oh, commentary. yeah. Uh, the question is, in one of my videos, I do mention that I don't agree with everything Brighton says. Let's see if I can say this succinctly. Brighton sets up a pattern for understanding the book as being primarily written to the first century Christians so that anything we understand from the book, they ought to have been able to understand as well. They're the ones who received the book. And so, as a result of this, we shouldn't be reading it as if it's pointing to newspaper stories today, because they could never have understood that. The thing is, he breaks that rule, I think about twice in his book, where he suddenly goes off and starts talking about stuff that isn't in the first century in any way, shape, or form. It isn't just the end of the world. And those are the points where I'm like, okay, you're, you're breaking the rule, um, which you've set up to interpret the book, which I think is correct. So this book, and I should have said this right at the start, this book is written to first century Christians. Whatever we find here should apply to them and us in the same measure. What it says about the end of the world, they should be able to see to the same extent that we should be able to see it. Which then means pinning the tail of the Antichrist now, as opposed to then, is kind of silly. As if the word Antichrist shows up in the book of Revelation. It doesn't, which is fascinating, seeing as guess who coined the term? John. We'll come back to that. Uh, beasts show up. Definitely, there's, there, are, there are hints of the end of the world, hints of that. But, uh, so I really don't like it when he breaks his own rule. Um, there's other little pieces. You know, he thinks that, um, uh, that the parallel phrase to verse 1, verse 8 in the end of the book is not Jesus, but it's God the Father. I think it's Jesus. It doesn't matter. Yeah, um, that kind of thing. So it's a great commentary. I, we ordered five copies of the, uh, the, the people's version, which means the Greek notes are taken out, um, which will be here next week that you can buy if you buy them out and order more. Um, one of the things I plan to do with Bible study and try to start doing is bringing our bookstore in and filling it up so I can recommend stuff for you to read um, while I teach, as if you don't have enough books already, maybe you don't. Um, best compliment I ever got from one of my videos, someone wrote me and said, ever since I started watching these, I've started reading books. <laughs> yes! It's awesome. All right, uh, one more question real fast. One minute. Or it just all makes sense. Revelation is an open book to me now. Yeah. <laughs> all right, cool. Let's close with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord God, you are the one who is, and who was, and who is to come. The Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, who, by the death and resurrection of your Son, has purchased us by his blood. We thank you that this word has come down to us, carrying faith to us, regenerating us into belief. We could, with patient endurance, be members of this kingdom, waiting through the tribulation for him to return. As we do this as a people here gathered at Bethany, please help this word to be ever more among us, confessed both here and in our homes. And if it be your will, uh, bring that confession to the area of Naperville all the more, uh, that others will hear and believe and rejoice with us as we wait for your son's return. We pray this for his sake. Amen. Amen. Cool. Thanks for coming.